Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with the next episode of Leopold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, I am wrapping up my southern Arizona winter vacation, uh, and I've been completely spoiled on this trip, thanks to a good friend, Jonathan O'Dell. Uh, Jonathan's been on our podcast in the past, um, He's, besides being a trained biologist and historian of conservation and uh, leader of migratory bird uh, management in Arizona and, and in, to some degree, the Pacific Flyway, uh, Jonathan is an unbelievable wild game chef. Unbelievable. He, he is the hands-on guy of... Uh, you, you can bring anything to the table and he'll cut it up and do something with it and you're going to love it when he's done with it. So Jonathan's going to spend some time here. We're going to talk about cranes. Uh, Jonathan's one, of, he's probably the only guy I know who's a fanatic crane hunter and I'm interested in cranes because he's fed them to me and they're fantastic. I'm interested in crane biology, crane management, uh, conservation of cranes. And I suspect it's going to lead us down a bunch of other tangents. Uh, I don't know what those will be, but we're going to find out. Uh, Jonathan told me about crane hunting. He said, imagine having to defend yourself from thousands of pterodactyls. That's what crane hunting is. Uh, tongue in cheek, there's no need to defend yourself, but just thinking about how cool that is. Um, but before we get into that, I want to make sure everyone knows that this podcast is brought to you by Leupold. Uh, Leupold Optics is the title sponsor of Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, very grateful for all they do for conservation, for hunting, for shooting. And uh, they've got a ton of new products coming out uh, for 2019. I'll be, I've been using some of them as prototypes. Uh, I'll be seeing the final versions of them at the SHOT Show that I go to uh, starting next week. And uh, I hope you go out to Leupold.com and check them out. Uh, they do a lot for us in, in our world of hunting and, and shooting and conservation, and I, I hope they would be on your list of, of companies to consider when it comes time to buy optics. Uh, also is uh, Go Hunt. Uh, you've heard us talk about Go Hunt. We really get into the Go Hunt uh, system during the application season of the spring and winter months. In fact, we've been throwing out some bonus episodes uh, related to using the Go Hunt system to draw tags because we want people to go elk hunting every year. And Go Hunt has a program or a service called the Insider that we are huge fans of. And the reason being is it takes all the information of the key western states and puts it right at your fingertips, has the best drawing odds, the best strategy articles. If you want to figure out how to draw tags. And people say, Randy, how do you draw so many tags? How, how do you guys do this? We use this Go Hunt Insider as our number one search tool, number one research tool. And it just makes it so much easier and so much more effective. So go to gohunt.com, sign up for the Insider, use promo code Randy, and you're going to get $50 of mad money. In other words, you're going to get $50 of free credit in their gear shop. So that gear shop is designed for the serious, hardcore Western hunter. Unbelievable gear shop. All the products or just about all the products we use, they carry in that gear shop. And then it gets even better. When you buy something in that gear shop, when you check out, use promo code Randy, and they're going to give you 10% off whatever you bought ex other than optics. Uh, that anything you buy when you check out the, at the gear shop, the use promo code Randy, 10% off, except optics. How's that? Great stuff. Gohunt.com, sign up for the Insider. And when you check out in both places, use promo code Randy, and you're going to save a ton of money. And then we have Orion Coolers. Uh, Orion Coolers is the, the cooler you see us using. Um, go to oriancoolers.com and learn about what I think are the best coolers 
that you can find anywhere. And when you buy it, check out, go to fill your cart, check out, and use promo code Randy and save 20%. Yeah, two zero twenty percent off the purchase price of your cooler by using promo code Randy. And then, if you want to save twenty percent more on some other products, it's Onyx Maps. So they also have a promo code that onyxmaps.com. Go out there. Any of the app products that you see us using, and you see us on our smartphones, we are using that for for out in the field, for our research. Uh, we've done a whole series of e-scouting videos with them. Onyx is the tool that we have to have to do what we do. So go to onyxmaps.com, use promo code Randy, and when you check out, they will give you a 20% discount on all the app products you buy when you use that promo code. So with that, we hope we saved you some money. Hope you made it worth your time for listening. And I'm going to flip the dial here and me and Mr. Odell sitting over there in that other couch, we're going to have a discussion about all kinds of things. Uh, A lot of crane discussion, a lot of food discussion, a lot of conservation discussion, and who knows what else. So here we go. All right, Jonathan, I've already told the audience that we have a return guest who is, by profession, a trained biologist, but (laughs) by passion or by just personal interest is a wild game chef. Do you count yourself as a wild game chef? You know, I would, I would, I would. I think people are free to call me whatever they want, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'll, I'll accept most titles. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an enthusiast and, and uh, wild game is almost a, a specialty of those who hunt, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, and eat it. Right. Um, you know, that's, they go hand in hand. And, and um, so when you're, when you're in that arena and you, you step outside um, the norm Mm-hmm. I think of what we, you know, we, we generally would do with our, our meals and you go, what else can I do with this? Yeah. How far can I stretch these bounds? Um, you know, particularly because you're dealing with a meat that's so vastly different than the, the domestic versions or, yep. or, you know, not even have a domestic counterpart yeah. um, that uh, you're like, okay, you know, how do I, how do I do this? You know, how it's, it's great to just simply, you know, burn it over some, some coals and, and, had some salt and pepper and and there you go. But yeah. you know, where where's the how far can we elevate this? And um one of my one of my favorite things is um James Beard, um, who was uh, is really kind of uh idolized um in American cuisine, American okay. American food. I'm not familiar with him. Um it, the well the the it, you know, if, you, if you've heard of Michelin star restaurants, Michelin star mm-hmm. chefs, that's, um, that was actually the Michelin guidebook. It was, you know, the tire company. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so these stars that, that they give um, were an indication early on when that when the, was first developed was an indication of um, how good these restaurants were. Like, you know, the, I think it's it, the, the higher the stars, this is worth the drive because yeah. it was tires. You're driving yeah. somewhere. <laughs> And so you, know, you, you, you want to drive out there to this place because yeah. it may not be right on the path you're taking. Yeah. Um, well, in America, I mean, we still have, you know, the Michelin guidebook is still out there and, and it's kind of the highest achievement in cuisine. Why have I not seen that? Maybe I hang out with the, the burn it on the grill crowd. <laughs> well, and then, um, so then you get to, you know, what is American cuisine? Mm-hmm. Um, what really is it? And um, uh, because, you know, there's so many influence. I mean, we, we know about French cooking. We know about uh, uh, 19 specific Mexican cuisines. We know about, you know, these, these different techniques and, and the way things are. Well, America is a melting pot. Yeah. And people brought their, their technique, I guess, their, their, you know, the way they've always brought it to America. But what was interesting was, was America had, um, the North American continent had, um, the ingredients were different. Yeah. Um, so you kind of had to make do with what you what you had, which is, mm-hmm. you know, like for us, you know, the France of America is is um, pretty much Louisiana. It's the Cajun Creole. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's our France. You yeah. know, um, because it was a mixture of French and African ingredients, and with the slave trade and those kind of things, and it and that's why it's so like 
really powerful in terms of flavors and things like that. And, um, but they had to deal with some things where, you know, our asparagus is a different color oh, really? than what you get in France. No and way. So uh, just a different different species. And then, of course, we had very unique uh, ingredients here like corn mm-hmm. that was only in North America, wild turkey. Turkeys were, you know, only in, in North America. Um, tomatoes. Um, tomatoes were, you know, kind of cultured out of out of the Americas and stuff. So it's there's kind of this interesting thing, but but when you get to it, you know, in in the American cooking world, James Beard is our he's our he's our hallmark. He's okay, our is, so is he? A, are you speaking of him in past tense? He's yeah, no longer so, here. Yeah, and so so James was alive long, long time ago. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, passed, but but he he left these you know incredible cookbooks and and his. Like his real drive was, was eating seasonally, hmm. eating what was in season and all that stuff. Okay, and, and um, so kind of kind of the way I knew James Beard um, uh, growing up. My mother was a was a uh, she worked in in institutional cooking. She was a short order chef. I mean, like I grew up in the kitchen hanging on her apron strings <laughs> at home and at work. And um, so I got to watch my mother, and she actually grew up on a ranch where her mother and her grandmother everything was from scratch. Yeah. You know, just just you know, I mean, my mother would would make homemade Thousand Island dressing. Um, I mean, to that extent, where it was just like you know, you didn't even just go buy Thousand Island; she was going to make it. And um, and you know baked goods and all that stuff. Well, I remember her kitchen in in the kitchen in our house up in the cupboard um, were kind of the hallmark old school cookbooks. Yeah, you know you had the Better Homes and Gardens. It was it was a red and white <laughs> yeah. gingham yeah. covered book, mm-hmm. and, and you know the, there weren't a whole lot at the time. I mean, my mom did have uh, she had Julie Child's book and those kind of things. But there was this book, and, and, and any time I was like too rambunctious in the kitchen or whatever, and mom mm-hmm. was trying to corral me, she would pull this book by James Beard um, mm-hmm. off the shelf and hand it to me. And it was, James, it was one of James's earlier books, and it was about wild game. Oh, wow. And, and it was really fascinating because there were, there, were, there were things in there at the time. You know, growing up in Montana, you, you're kind of limited in... in scope of what species are around you or what you know about for sure so that's how i learned about you know woodcock i was like whoa what is this thing and you know i'd seen and heard of moose i'd never actually you know gotten one until i was a little bit older but there was moose in there and there was pheasant and there was i mean just a plethora of 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 animals that james beard had written about most people forget james beard actually had that wild game cookbook which was very early in his 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 um uh kind of his writing and his cooking and all those things Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the james beard i got to know and then you know later on you kind of understand the the american culture you know cuisine thing going on and it was he really pressed seasonal like eat eat what's now what's available now don't Mm -hmm. you know and it's 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 particularly pertinent to those of us who hunt yeah because there is a season for everything, you know. Yeah, yeah when yeah. things come about, this is the time we're hunting them. Mm-hmm. We should eat them now. Well, what what do you put with them? How do you you know? <laughs> how do you start you know melding these things? And so, yeah. um, particularly when you go you know back a hundred years in American culture, when um, you know canning was a big thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you were storing things for the winter. You had to, um, was- and so you know you're pulling things out, and and uh, but because you know a lot of times in, in the winter in a lot of places. There isn't a whole lot of fresh produce or whatever, so what you're eating was pickled or canned or whatever, and and so mm-hmm. that kind of comes back. And so, but, so by training, so if folks listening, Jonathan, you are a biologist for Arizona Game and Fish, who is a migratory bird manager. Am I, yeah, am I so that? I'm I'm the uh, Arizona representative on the Pacific Flyway for okay. migratory birds. Um, I've been pretty much in the small game program for. I don't know, getting close to a decade now. Yeah. And um but um uh when uh Wade Zerlingo came on, mm-hmm. um uh Wade had a real penchant for uh upland birds yeah. for quail. I mean that was you know, that was his thing. And so mm-hmm. when we first sat down and, and said, Okay, you know, how do we divide this labor up? You know, and, and so, you know, the migratory side was really a chance. It's something that that um I've often seen from afar because of all my previous supervisors, they've filled that role. Yeah. And I've had to step in every once in a while. And, and so I kind of understood some of the mechanics of it, but not the, the full breadth of it. And, and Wade and I said, all right, you know, how do we, how do we separate this? Because on paper, someone's got to be 
this and someone's going to be that, even though mm-hmm. we both generally end up working, you know, mutually on, on just about everything. And he's, and Wade, of course, Wade hates traveling. <laughs> <laughs> he hates getting in an airplane, going anywhere <laughs> and uh, stuff. So he's like, he's like, if you want to try it, I said, yes, it's a great growth opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've been heavily entrenched in the Dove um, scene down here for a long time. I think, uh, um, uh, three supervisors ago before Wade, um, <laughs> they, uh, um, there's a, uh, we banned a lot of morning doves every year and, um, Mike wasn't particularly fond of that task of coordinating that and, uh-huh. and entering data and all that stuff. He's like, here, I got a project for you. So I've been doing that, man, I think since, you know, many, many years ago and, and, uh, when I first started. And so, um, I've always kind of been in that, you know, one foot in, but not quite all the way there, but now, you know, I'm, I'm there and in and, and, uh, yeah. Wade was having a lot of good fun with, with the upland birds and the, the taking over the rabbits and squirrels and all those stuff and getting all the, the, the questions I used to get asked. <laughs> like, Here, man, you can have it. <sighs> well, a, a little background folks of, of, Jonathan, you've been on the podcast a couple times before. This is because the fourth or fifth time. It might be. We Every time we come to Arizona, we end up being lucky that we we have a bunch of friends come and join us. Wade, who we mentioned, Jonathan, and a few others. And Jonathan takes the task. He, he, there's no expectation that Jonathan has to cook. But he travels with uh, you have these totes of your cooking gear is, <laughs> That's a is, that, is, that, them. is that part of your travel package there well so i uh i do you know as, as we, i think we've talked about it in the past i i do wild game cook-offs yeah um and you know there's the the, the world championship squirrel cook-off in arkansas mm-hmm. there's you know i mean when you're traveling to these events likely likely i think i'll be at the um the uh, backcountry hunters and anglers rendezvous this year. Oh, will you? Um, yeah, competing on on the Arizona chapters team and stuff. All so, right. Um, you know, it's uh, you kind of. My, my wife, when I first started, I was using the stuff out of our kitchen, mm-hmm. our home kitchen. And if you ever want to really annoy your wife, you know, just take half of the stuff with you. <laughs> that's in your kitchen, <laughs> and then bring it back. And it's usually not in the best of shape when it comes back right. <laughs> um, you know it may it may have like some extra staining or you know baked on grilled on stuff to yeah. it and she's like ah, why do you have to do all stuff so i started building my own kind of travel travel collection um oh, just okay. for you know when i'm cooking on the tailgate even you know out in the field sometimes i've um you know bring my stuff and it's like you know i'm gonna i'm you know we we could eat really poorly Mm-hmm. Which I think a lot of times, you know, hunters do, you know, we rough it, we're eating grill right. or yeah. or beef jerky or whatever. But sometimes, you know, like you don't have to. Yeah. You know, well, we could we could have a decent meal while we're out in the field, maybe once or twice. You know, you so. proved that to the <laughs> highest degree because it on Monday you made some chili with we made coos chili. Coos chili. We had some some deer from uh, Marks and Wade's hunt. Yeah. And then one night you uh, made javelina hams from a javelina I shot. Mm-hmm. You uh, you brined and cured put, it. Yeah. Cured it for what? Two days. Two days. Mm-hmm. And then we put it on the Traeger. Mm-hmm. And then let's see. I'm I'm going through the list here. We had fiesta night. Yeah. So um, we had uh, green tamales, grilled quail, uh, homemade chimichangas. Um, yeah, I don't remember all the stuff we did that night. What, but it was what like, were those corn wrap things with the? That's the tamales. The okay, tamales. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, I did duck see. confit tacos last night as yeah. an appetizer. Yeah, and then tonight, what was that crane that we, we had? did? Sandhill crane fajitas. Oh my gosh, that was so good. <laughs> oh, Sandhill crane. So in Montana, I'm allowed. I, I have to apply for a tag for a Sandhill crane and. To be honest, Jonathan, I had zero interest in Sandhill Crane until you served it to us last year. Yeah. And we went on a long discussion about Sandhill Cranes last year. And I feel negligent that I didn't get around to doing it. But you brought Sandhill Crane. Mm-hmm. And, and was this, 
right here in southern Arizona yeah, again? Yeah, southeastern Arizona. Um, had the hunt again this year. It was actually um, the, because of, of my status with the Pacific Flyway and all that stuff, uh, mm-hmm. Arizona was chair of the flyway in 2018. Oh, cool. And so I had a little bit of extra traveling. <laughs> I had <laughs> um, a lot more coordination to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and and for those folks who are out there, you know, to, to give you some perspective, um, uh, in our flyway, um, most of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service offices are on the East Coast. Even so for the Pacific they're, they're three hours ahead. Well, if you have to call back to Washington, D.C. Oh, right. for any, we have some here in the, in the West, but yeah. if you got to call back to D.C. for, for a reason, um, they're you know, pretty much already at work and have been there for a while by the time you show mm-hmm. up. So if you need to get some, something done, you got to show up about sure. 6 a.m. to start <laughs> talking to them at 9 a.m. <laughs> well, it, the, the, other, the flip side of that is that um, Anchorage... Um, the uh, Alaska, the other state right. in our one of the other <laughs> big states in our flyway, um, doesn't start work until about five hours um, after you start your day. So mm-hmm. it starts very early trying to talk to the East Coast to get some things done, and then you have to wait a while until Anchorage gets on board and starts work at eight a.m. <laughs> and for you, the day's almost over. <laughs> and so, uh, um, yeah, there's there's some coordination going on there. Not yeah. many flyways have that many time zones to to worry about. So. Yeah. So are cranes technically considered waterfowl? So they are migratory birds. They're covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, mm-hmm. They are webless. Mm-hmm. Um, that's usually the way the birds are, are divided. You either you have you have game and non-game, and then you have webbed and webless. Okay. Um, and so you know, obviously, the webbed are the web feet, geese, ducks, yeah, um, those kind of things. And then you have webless, which morning doves fall into, which sandhill cranes fall into, um, mm. and all that. Um, the one thing that's been interesting about cranes is that cranes, um, much like a lot of the other webless species, doves and those don't fall under the um, uh, the, the steel shot only restriction like oh, waterfowl really? does. Right. Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. So you can hunt cranes with lead shot. Much the same way you would do with morning doves, yeah. I did not know that. Huh. What do you use? Uh, I generally tend to use steel just because um, geese like traveling with center cranes. Um, (laughs) If the chance comes. Yeah, it it happens. It it seems like almost every year uh, geese will present an opportunity to us and I don't want to have to be worrying about what's in my shotgun or not being able to take a shot because um, I've got the wrong loads in or, or, you know, carrying lead when it should be steel and stuff. So if you just shoot all steel, it's, you know, it kind of saves the day. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I I'm just thinking the many times I'm out waterfowl hunting and a, a warden will check me for lead shot or steel shot. Mm-hmm. But if I was sandhill crane hunting, I could say, Oh, wait a second. Hunting cranes, like doesn't matter. Yeah, I think he, um he'd probably say, Are you only hunting cranes? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see your bag, you know, see what's right. We have gut uh ducks will buzz the field um when we have mm-hmm. our decoys out and things like that. And, yeah. Um, but, so you uh, decoy these cranes? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's mm-hmm. been a, a a game changer. Um, you know, when when I first started crane hunting, uh, I didn't have anybody. Yeah. Um, it was just you know, you got to learn this. And I was like, okay. Um, well, thankfully, I mean, one of the the benefits of uh, growing up how I did and all that stuff is is my first ever gun that my dad gave me was a ten gauge. <laughs> and uh, knocked, him, knocked me on my butt the first so time I ever here's shot Here's this it. Montana kid walking around with a 10-gauge. Well, and well, you know, I mean, that, some of those birds up in Montana are pretty hardy. I mean, if we were going to shoot geese <laughs> or something, you know, we, we had yeah. to put a hurting on them. So, yeah. um, but since I'd moved to Arizona, um, you know, it, it had pretty much been mothballed. Mm. And um, I was like, well, you know, this crane thing. And I said, well, maybe I can pull the old 10-gauge out, out, out of the dust for a little bit. And, mm-hmm. Um, started trying to figure it out, and so initially when I when I first started, um, I started pass shooting. You know, I was I was didn't have any decoys, didn't have anything, and yeah. I I used to just watch. I would scout the birds that you know the day before really hard and see where they were flying the lowest. And what I said, I had two chances. It was either catch them when they were at the lowest, you know, flying over, so that way it wasn't I wasn't just taking wild shots. Um, or find a field that they were going to religiously that I could like, you know, hide myself in. If there was a center pivot on these these big, you know, circular pivot 
irrigation systems Arizona yeah. has, if I could brush up and, and get in there real tight and just hopefully, you know, be at the right one at the right day. So, yeah. um, and so over time I kind of, you know, I learned, um, just, you know, kind of watching these birds and studying and kind of getting into this. And, and, um, then eventually it was like, uh, oh, I should buy decoys. And, 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 and you know, I mean, this is, this is just kind of my own personal thing is, uh, I, I bought socks, I bought the inflatables, I bought silhouettes. Mm-hmm. And, and not to say that people don't kill cranes over those, they do. Right. Um, but there was always something really lacking. And um, so the more I investigated, I, I learned about these full body decoys that used to be made by a company called Outlaw Decoys. Okay. Um, and they had gone out of business. And, and uh, so I put the feelers out on Craigslist all across the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, if you have Outlaw Decoys and you're looking to sell them, I no, no, it doesn't matter the condition, whatever, like I really want them. I want these full bodies. Because mm-hmm. our only other alternative was to actually carve our own out of foam Ooh. and like wrap them and paint them and do stuff. And, yeah. And um, so it was, you know, that was pretty fruit, fruitless um, in my searches because like no one was ever going to give them up and and uh, all that. And uh, real geese decoys had purchased um, Outlaw, and they said, "Oh yeah, we're coming out with some." Turns out they were just making silhouettes. And, and, and um, we're, we're, you're talking Outlaw had made actual sandhill crane. They make full body plastic sandhill mm. crane decoys, okay. and they were about the best you could get at the time. Well. Mm. Um, because I've always got an ear to the ground in the in the crane community, um, there were these rumblings of a of a company in in um, Kansas called Deception Decoys. Yeah, and um, I was like, "Huh, what's going on there?" And um, <laughs> and then eventually you started you started seeing advertisements for them, um, and I was like, "Man, I mean, these are expensive." Um, the only other the only other um, uh, really like really well built quality decoys that we heard about was from uh, Don Mintz, who's a carver up in Oregon. Mm. Um, and they were fully flocked decoys, but they were $115 a piece. Um, and the deception decoys were selling for about two seventy five dollars for a three-pack, so it was still $90-some dollars. Yeah. And uh, I was like, man, oh, this is crazy. And um, so I was kind of, I was still on the fence, you know, about it. I'm like, I've often told everyone, I said, you know, once you're a crane hunter, you're, once you've made the commitment, you, you need to just go in both feet and like, <laughs> like forget all this stuff. Like <sighs> literally just spend the money that it's going to take um, to be there. And and so uh, I happened to be at the World Championship Squirrel Cook-Off uh, a few years mm-hmm. ago and we stopped down in uh, Stuttgart, Arkansas um, doing some early teal hunting and walked into Max Prairie Wings, yep. um, which is like duck, you know, yeah. nirvana. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just you're you're blown away the moment you walk in the door i mean they have their decoy department is so huge it's ridiculous Mm. um it looks like you're buying shoes you know at like a shoe store yeah because everyone is out and you're like oh look at that you can compare them and stuff but they had a set in there they had three of them and the moment i saw them i went wow these are these are it so (laughs) um i ended up i called uh, uh garrett um at deception and i said hey I said, I love, I love your decoys. You know, this is, uh, I said, it's amazing. We started chatting because, you know, the, the birds here in the, in the, in the Pacific flyway um, are a different population than what they see in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, and um, I said, yeah, we, you know, we got all graders and we were kind of chit-chatting back and forth. And, and I said, I said, look, I said, here's, the, here's my problem. I'm a state employee. Mm. not a rich man <laughs> you know um but i really love crane hunting and i would love to get some of your decoys um you know how can you help me out yeah you get any and seconds you or factory or seconds yeah. and i asked him that i said do you have any factory seconds he's like yeah we get some every year some of the guys buy them and i said okay i said you know when you when you get some factory seconds up any condition you give me a call you know mm. and we'll get something set up and and so, yeah, sure enough, he called me and he's like, you know, hey, how many were you looking for? And this and the other thing. He's like, you want me to paint them? I'm like, no, no, I'm so cheap. Like, just send them. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll figure out how to get them painted and all that stuff. And, <sighs> um, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep this purchase off the radar, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, let me, let me see how many, you know. And so, I got the first dozen and um, mm. painted them out in the backyard and, and. Uh, just I had some rattle can and stuff, and I was really trying to make them look, you know, much like they they do when they come from the factory. And um, you know, they, I think I did a fairly 
you know, decent job with the, the firm. I had to do few repair work because it's in yeah. their seconds. And, um, but yeah, the first year, it was a game changer. It was like, it, it, I'd never seen it before with cranes. Mm. I mean, they, they just, they saw the decoys and just locked up wings, came straight down. And they're, you know, they're, they're pterodactyls. These things are huge. Yeah. You know, these graders are seven foot wingspans. They're four wow. feet tall. You're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is like the best thing ever. Um, and so the group of guys that I hunt with, you know, we said, all right, we're going we're gonna to spread the pain. Okay. So I got the first dozen, my other body butt, second dozen, another oh, body butt. Oh, wow, another that one. many. So, so that way when we come together, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, the it, if you're familiar with the rest, it's like the Power Rangers or the or like the Voltron back in the day or whatever, you know, when, when everyone comes together and forms the big, you know, creature, it's the same thing with our decoys. When we yeah. all come together, the decoy spread is, is complete and, mm -hmm. and all that. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, the, the whole is more powerful than the parts. So... Um, but it's been it's been absolutely great. I mean, you know, we spend much like folks who do deer camp or elk camp right. or whatever. Yep. We do crane camp. Wow, you know, you're was, the only guy I've ever met who has crane camp. Yeah, we. I was down there for two and a half weeks this year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as as everyone kind of went through their hunts and stuff, and uh, our hunts down here, it's you know, it's it's a structured draw system and um, with some stratified hunts. And so you're if you're drawn for the hunt, um, you have three days. You're given three days um, to hunt three birds. Okay. So, oh, well, and, so if you draw, you get three birds. Yep. And so you can get all three on the first day or over the course of those three days, it doesn't matter. Hmm. But um, yeah, it's it's limited uh, restriction. The, the mid-continent birds, that, those ones that are further out in the Midwest, mm -hmm. you can take three a day, you know, possession limits of nine. It's it's pretty yeah. insane, but they're a little more tightly controlled here in the West. And, and so, yeah, you're allowed three birds and... Um, then you know the hunt's over, and then there's a, a hunt that follows. There's a day off, and then another hunt, and so um, for somebody else, and you know another group of hunters and stuff, and that that allows me to put more hunters in the field. Yeah. Um. At, you know, instead of everybody bombing in and just overcrowding everybody, and yeah. Landowners like having all kinds of problems. Um. It, it, it helps to kind of stretch it out a little bit over the course of about you know two and a half, three weeks, and so yeah, it's it, for us. It's everybody comes together and. Um, so you have your hunt, and then if somebody else has another hunt, we go and help them get them, you know, brushed up, blind up. We're always watching the birds. Okay, you know, here's a good, <laughs> here's a good setup, and so we'll we'll do everything we can to make you successful. But if we don't have tags, mm -hmm. you know, that morning, once you're set, man, we're heading down to the river to go hunt ducks, <laughs> um, or then you know we'll come back, eat lunch, mm -hmm. and then we'll go out and chase quail. We'll we'll go shoot doves. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a real like a monster bird hunting, you know kind of couple weeks and <laughs> shooting pterodactyls. So we eat a lot of birds yeah it's there's a lot going on uh, that week too. so those breasts uh, those crane breasts that you brought here and made the fajitas out of they came from your crane camp mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we, we uh, were all we had three hunters this year um all three of us were successful tagged out um and what, uh yeah it was a good time what what would be your estimate of how much meat you get off a crane um, I would say if you get a greater sandhill crane, you're probably looking at um, when you take the drumsticks, the thighs, mm -hmm. uh, the breasts, um, and even the the wing meat um, all together. You're probably close to about four pounds. Oh wow! Um, you know, three and a half, four pounds. Uh, a lesser, probably maybe closer to about three. Okay. Um, a little bit less. They're you know they're just small birds, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's those those cross breeds that we we call Canadas or Canadians. Um, they're they're way bigger than a lesser, but they're not quite graders. Okay. Um, and I love those birds because they don't count against our quota. Um, so we have a quota of how many graders we can take. Yeah. And that's how the hunts are arranged. Gotcha. That's how many people I can tell to put in the field. But when you mm -hmm. shoot Canadians. Um, because they're not graders, they don't count against our quota, but right. they have just about as much meat as a grader uh -huh. does. It's kind and of I'm a... like, yes. <laughs> you, know, you get the same end result. Oh, always. yeah, yeah. I still get a lot of meat. And, huh. and, uh, so uh, how how big is the crane hunting community? I, you're, you're the only crane fanatic I've ever encountered. I've known people who, yeah, I went and did it. It was kind of fun. I know people in Texas who are serious about yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's really big in the but, Midwest. Um, you know, here in Arizona, we're right now, um, we're meeting the demand 
um, for folks who are going. Um, there's not many people who don't get drawn um, for it. Um, and usually if they do, it's because, you know, there's there's some tricks to the whole draw system mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, some guys will, well, and it could be they only can put in for certain days. And yeah. if they've only got two kind of periods available mm -hmm. and those are full already, yeah. there might've been tags, you know, ready to go for another one, but they just didn't have it on their applications. So, right. um, you know, I tell the guys, look, I said, just, you know, put in all five choices, put them in the order you can, you know, that way at least, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty close to, to for sure getting a tag yeah, and to go it just what, in case something fills up. So what's this period of time that you hold this season? Um, so the hunts, um, we have, uh, um, uh, our big area, um, I call it our multi-unit area. It's, it's where the vast majority of cranes are, are hanging mm -hmm. out. Um, and this year I think we counted like 36,000 down there. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, that's usually that usually starts about it's the it's about a weekend or two before Thanksgiving, um, okay. and then runs through um, Thanksgiving. Actually, it's the weekend before Thanksgiving. That's when it starts. Is the Friday, Saturday, Sunday? That's the first hunt, and then you move into Thanksgiving week and um, kind of rolls on. And then um, uh, we have uh, another area that starts uh, a little later um, after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's just to deal with with different issues in different areas, um, and it so it'll run into December, and then uh, we're actually um, opening a new unit this year um, mm. to to tie up our border with New Mexico and where the cranes exist, and um, that'll have a pretty limited number of of hunters in it. But um, uh, you know, we've we've been seeing birds in there, and like I said, this has just kind of been let's let's parallel new mexico where the birds are and, and uh, see what happens so mm -hmm. so when you do this from an agency standpoint do you have to submit your sheets and proposals to the u.s fish and wildlife service for approval on yeah cranes? and so um uh what's what's really kind of neat is so i being the chair um i had to shepherd a lot of these these things um this year with our council members and all that and so i was in minnesota um in october mm -hmm. for the service regulations committee meeting which is when all four flyways and um everyone shows up and meets with the fish and wildlife service for next year's seasons gotcha so in october we were approving the seasons that'll go in the federal register for the 2019 uh, 2020 season so, oh wow that far in advance yeah we have to we have to think that far out now so hmm. wow well crane honey every time I, I eat it because the only times i've eaten it you've cooked it <laughs> did you know cranes were that good eating when you first started hunting them um not when i first i mean when i first went out i was just kind of like well this will be this will be different and fun because i grew up in montana you know mm -hmm. and i'd seen the cranes and and we'd never you know, I mean, that wasn't, I don't think, on our radar up there. Yeah. It wasn't until I got down here. And, and that's kind of the thing is is crane hunting um, down here. Most people are, are always surprised to hear, you know, that we have such, you know, really great crane hunting because mm -hmm. they're hunted in Idaho. They're hunted in Montana. I mean, right. You get them a few places along the, the, the trail, but... You know the guys down here. There's there's a serious crowd of crane hunters um, in Arizona, and it's because we winter so many of them. Like you don't get to see this many in the Pacific Flyway. Yeah. Um. You know anywhere else, and so, um, and I, I you know, I, I think when I stepped into this role, and a lot of my supervisors, kind of some of that history that that comes along with the the migratory bird here in Arizona. I mean, that's it's it's definitely one thing we we pride ourselves on we were the first state in the pacific flyway um to start hunting sandhill cranes back in 1981 mm. um the they had been hunting cranes i think in the in the central flyway since uh the 60s yeah um but you know we said we had a, a smaller population and stuff and, and arizona was the first one to kind of step up and say hey you know we should start a hunt on these yeah um and uh so yeah i've been i've been very protective of the cranes and um, we have these these great roost areas and stuff. I mean, it's it's it, literally you can see it on film, you can see it in pictures, but until you're laying down mm -hmm. there, you know, with a gun or even without, yeah. just having twenty thousand cranes come off this roost <laughs> and fly over you in these waves, mm -hmm. it, it's it's beyond words. Mm. of just how amazing it, it is to see that 
and mm-hmm. and you know here's this little desert i mean it's not like a lake it's not you know i mean it's i think this year it's probably not even bigger than you know 15 acres no of, way. of water and we have you know gobs and gobs of cranes on this one one roost area and you're like holy smokes like what yeah. you know so historically they've been just coming here for millennia hmm. you know it, i mean this is the old this is the oldest um bird this is the oldest evolutionarily this is the oldest bird in the in the record um based hmm. on fossil records like they really? haven't changed much um in uh, millennia no. yeah um so when it's there's that many of them in such a small area how is the habitat protected is it public land is it a refuge well, is so a- um both of the um through the pacific flyway and the management plan for that we have for the the um uh the rocky mountain population um arizona is mandated to to maintain two wintering roost sites Mm -hmm. and both of those roost sites are state wildlife areas oh okay um and and so we for years now have have had full control um you know we're we're always you know pumping water to make sure stuff's there and Mm -hmm. and really working hard on them and and stuff to make sure that the cranes have some place to go because um wintering down here is very different because um the two the mid-continent population the rocky mountain population cross in arizona and new mexico okay um these are the kind of two areas and so you know we don't i don't think we we coordinate as much as we probably could Mm -hmm. um i think we've been lucky in the past sometimes because um uh, cranes eat a lot of corn uh, um, a lot of scrap corn from from harvested fields and stuff and um in the past if if um New Mexico over by Bosque del Apache, which is the well-known mm-hmm. refuge for Santa Cranes. I mean, that's that's what built their name. Mm-hmm. Um, I know one year uh, they couldn't grow corn um, down by the refuge because it was uh, it was the seed they gotten was GMO. Oh, um, okay. You know, it, was, it was genetically modified, and so they wouldn't allow them to grow it. Well, it just so happened that year, um, you know, serendipitously, that valley, the Sulphur Springs Valley, was packed with corn because we had a new ethanol plant going in. Mm. And so there was corn galore down there. So those birds who didn't have a whole lot of food and started looking elsewhere um, didn't have to bypass us and go to Mexico. They just fell right in our valley. I think it was our high year count. We had well over 40 some thousand birds, Hmm. um, you know, in the valley. I mean, it was was packed with birds um, Hmm. everywhere you went. But thankfully we had a lot of corn and food to be able to hold them and maintain them because otherwise they'll pass us and head down into the, the farming areas of Sonora okay um down in mexico so they they don't have their on x map ship no. <laughs> that says oh this is where i gotta go they just go where the habitat they and go where the, the food the... is they go where the water is yeah and and those roost sites you know we don't hunt them on the roost sites um as a as a practice because if you hunt them on the roost they won't come back oh, okay um so those are fully off limits during the crane hunts you can't you know hunt them on the roost and because we want to just give them a a safe refuge and stuff and it's it's great for watchable wildlife i mean the birders come down and mm-hmm. every year actually the the there's a, a festival down there called wings over wilcox um mm-hmm. now that this town you know absolutely has embraced all these cranes being there and and so there's a lot of folks who come down for that and huh. you know want to photograph and do things and right. so there's excursions and classes and you know gifts and stuff there's people who do artwork write write books you know giant posters all kinds of stuff they do so um and yeah i mean it's crane cranes are very special um overall i know um some people have pause when it comes to to cranes uh-huh. um because you've heard the stories i mean they're very long-lived birds They'll, yeah that's i was gonna ask you that is I, you, you take a species like crane and i think a lot of people when they hear crane they think oh there aren't mer- very many of them and if you are the right places there's more than the habitat can sustain and then you have this i'll call i don't know stigma is the right word that they they're known to live long lives so should we be hunting them yeah they're you know they they they, they do live long lives they are monogamous um for the most part it's not never a hundred percent thing, and you know if they lose their partner, um, actually one of the the biggest natural mortality factors, like you know completely um, off the radar, is is uh, telephone wires, um, is is uh, electrical, you know lines. Really, stuff. They yeah, they run into, into them, um, and uh, so usually we have a few every year 
we'll find down in the valley. Power will go off to some part of Cochise County and you know, likely a Sandhill Crane had flown into into the power lines and stuff. Um, but um, yeah, it's it, it, they are monogamous to some point um, until their partner dies for yeah. one reason or another, and then they'll find another one. Hmm. Um, uh, the mid continent population, like we were talking about, that's in the Central Flyway, it, it's almost I I believe it's it's approaching half a million birds. Um, wow, you know, and and some of these birds come all the way from Siberia. Um, no way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They they fly over from Siberia across the Bering Strait through Alaska and follow down. We have a huge population in Alaska, a lot up in the northern Canadian provinces. Um, so it's big. You'll get a kick out of this. We're Sitka blacktail hunting in the Alpine of southeast Alaska. And when you climb up from the ocean, you don't have to get too high to get above tree line. And I think we're up maybe 1,600 feet elevation. And it gets like this boggy type habitat. There was a sandhill crane that kept me awake all night, every night for all days of that hunt. And I, I vowed that someday I'm going to get even with them. But the, the diversity of habitats, I guess, or the diversity of locations where they can find suitable habitats was astounding to me. Yeah, and they it, their call is very you know it's a distinct that rolling trumpet, <laughs> yeah. um, and it can be heard that call that the actual call they make can be heard from like a mile and a half away. Mm. Um, it carries just through the air. Yeah, um, like nobody's business. And of course, they have probably some of the most incredible eyesight next to like a, a predatory bird like a hawk or an eagle or something. I mean, they see everything. I mean, I know we've we've blown it so many times with cranes coming in and, and you just move a little bit and they see it really? and phew, they're gone, you know, cause they see them full color. Like, you know, most of the other birds do. Oh, they do. Oh okay. yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm always remindful of people like, don't show them your white monkey face. Okay? <laughs> They've seen that before. They'll, they'll fly away. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're very intelligent birds and, um, you know, they have this great courting dance ritual that mm -hmm. they do. Um, but you know, I, is it, they're they're really amazing, and and one of the things that I think people um, miss is that uh, much like a lot of the species in America, um, they were down, mm -hmm. um, down significantly. Um, pretty much everything was You're right, uh, be it elk, ducks, cranes, turkeys, turkeys white-tailed deer. Yeah. Everything um, was 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 really low, and um, when we we were the first state to start hunting back in eighty one. Um, and really the, the, the Sandhill Crane has become like this, it's been a jewel in the crown of this state federal partnership mm. of managing migratory birds. Okay. Um, because the Rocky Mountain population wasn't very big um, for a long time. And um, so, you know, instituting these management plans and everything, but, um, you know, cause they were, the biologists who preceded us, all the, the old guard guys that we really look up to, um, you know, to think of where they were and they were worried about, you know, we're, we're just trying to get the birds to this number. Yeah. We felt that, you know, 17,000 was the number that they were just hoping to get the population to. Of the entire... Of just the Rocky, Rocky Mountain, Mountain population. Yeah. Just those one in the Rocky Mountains. You know, we, we got to get to 17,000. And it's, it's kind of a... It, it's a blessing now because you know we're the the new class is here, yeah. <laughs> all of us new guys, um, uh, and it, you know we have a ceiling on how many birds we're supposed to have um, because when you reach these these excessive numbers, um, they can do a lot of habitat damage just on on natural habitat um, on uh, farm fields for farm they cause a right. lot of um, human wildlife interaction problems and you know we're we're always tasked with the issue of well, how are we going to deal with it? And, and I mean, you see it with snow geese, you see it with Canada geese, yep. um, you know, which is why we have the conservation seasons now. Um, mm -hmm. Those spring seasons, they're not hunting seasons. Right. Um, they have a specific name. They're actually conservation seasons, which is why you're, you know, it's, it's almost kind of, um, you know, all the restrictions you have during normal hunting right. kind of go away. I mean, you can use electronic calls. There's no plugs in your gun. I mean, like, cause we're trying to bring those numbers down. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with cranes. I mean, we have a, we have really? a threshold that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of cool to think in, in less than a hundred years where, you know, guys like Roosevelt and Hemingway and all these, they're like, the game is gone. Yeah. 
you know, the, the America is not what it used to be. And that's why everybody went to Africa because it's yeah. like, oh, the game's still plentiful there. And how short-sighted that really was, those statements, mm-hmm. to think that, you know, it was never going to come back because, man, it has in mm. in in tenfold, hundredfold. Um, you know, I think you look at you look at some of these species now that, um, you know, we're we're still trying to we're still trying to help and we're still trying to protect and all that stuff. But, you know, you can almost step back and just kind of oh, take a take a, a a breath of relief that you know we've done this amazing thing. Um, you know, the, the Turkey Federation, as a classic example, mm-hmm. 40 years, in 40 years from the time they founded, there's almost no place to you, put a turkey anymore. <laughs> yeah. They have covered <laughs> Mission the Mission accomplished. Yeah. Well, 40 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a phenomenally fast amount of time to, to reach that goal. Yeah. And, and you kind of go, okay, well... Wow, what what's next? And that's you know where where the Turkey Federation had to change. They had to learn how to shift gears. They're one of the first <laughs> ones where yeah. they were like, okay, okay, we 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 put turkeys back out there. They're everywhere. There's almost no place to put them anymore. What do we do now? Well, save the habitat, save the hunt. You know, yeah. they had to shift gears on their focus. Well, what do we do now? Yeah, you know, to, to help the turkeys and it and it really is about you know making sure the habitat stays the best that it possibly can and restore some areas that have been degraded and also you know. Bring more hunters in, as we've seen, you know, in the last, it, pretty much in the same time that you know, and, and not because this isn't a direct tie to the Turkey Federation, but mm-hmm. we've seen hunters decline in the same amount of time that the Turkey Federation has been so successful. Yeah, um, and, and really all the organizations. Yeah, and so you know, state agencies like mine and, and all. I mean, everybody's worried. I mean, you know, the, the alarm bell got sounded. Yeah, about twenty years ago. You know, that all of a sudden someone woke up and went, hey, guys, there's going to be a problem. Right. Things are not rosy. Um, you know, and, and uh, our, thankfully our agency, I mean, we took it to heart um, that, and there's, things are coming. And, and yeah. I think everybody's, you know, fully aware of it now if they haven't heard about it. You know, um, how, do, how do we make more hunters? Yeah. Um, how do we, you know, how do we we continue to support the things that we love here because the user pay user or user pay everyone benefit system is at risk yeah i mean there's no doubt about it um but you know we've we've been successful we've we've brought these species back but now it's now it's a, it's a new i saw one of the um one of the the talks they said the most endangered species now is the hunter right um, and not the animals. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, using cranes as the example, you said that seventeen thousand was this dream some people had. Yeah. You blew through that, and now you're past. You're you're bumping through the ceiling of what the habitat and tolerance and everything else yeah. can be, and you're having to manage for an excess above what. Yeah, we're trying to bring them back down below the ceiling, and that's usually when you know permits and things are ramped up. My allocation uh, of of birds every year is, is I, man, I can't I I can't even remember a time where we've been higher. Really, um, in terms of the number of birds that we can harvest, and so um, you know it's allowed us to get very liberal with seasons and and you know putting out as many hunters as I can. I mean, we've I think in my tenure now um, with the small game program, I mean. Um, uh, I bumped us from, from two birds to three, Mm -hmm. um, several years ago with one of my supervisors. I I kept running the numbers for him because I really kind of got into cranes like overwhelmingly. And I was like, you know, it's like, what are the odds someone's actually going to shoot all three? And I was running the numbers and I was showing my boss, I'm like, like we could do it. We could still be under the quota. And and he's like, he's like, all right, you know, I'll give it a shot and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then it just, you know, kind of, it was like, well, you know, man, look at our quota. We could actually take more. Um, you know, cause we're, we're always, all the states are very cognizant and careful about, you know, we're, we're playing a numbers game mm-hmm. and, um, you know, so it's, it's hunting math, which I always, yeah. we laugh about <laughs> hunting math, hunting math is different. Right? Uh, um, and, and, and so it's, you can put more hunters than what you're actually going to like, if you're trying to hit a number mm-hmm. of, of harvest, well, you have to put more hunters out right, than not what you're taking because they're not all going to, it's not 100% right. success rate. Yeah. So, and so we, we play this, you know, well, let me lean on conservancy, but, you know, we still mm-hmm. want to kind of be able to, to take that, that harvestable excess off. And, 
and that and and kind of do our part. So yeah, we're it's like I said, it, it the Sand Hill Crane became a crown jewel of the Pacific Flyway um, in the time that, that we've had it, just because you know we we could show we managed these long lived birds um, with hunting mm-hmm. um, as a part of it, and and no one had thought back then. I mean, if um, I, you know swans. Yeah. Swans are another example, you know. I mean, we have um, a couple states, uh, Utah and Nevada, um, that that really have a, a a lot of our allocation for tundra swans. Well, yeah. coincidentally, there's a trumpeter swan, and that one is really in in trouble. And so, they've gone the extra mile to educate hunter. You have to take a course yeah. um, before you can apply um, to know the difference between the two, and and we're really tightly controlled. And if 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 they reach these these quotas during the because it's a mandatory checkout um, when you when you're hunting swans and then man if we hit this number of, of trumpeters the season shut down yeah and that's and that's kind of it and, and um but I mean even in the last 23 years I mean looking at trumpeter swan numbers um, those birds have doubled yeah. in 23 years um, in, in number and so it's you know you you can manage a lot of these species um, but it's just it's I, I think if I had to go back 25 years mm-hmm. and I was talking to the old guard of the Pacific Flyway right. who really did the hard work of how to, you know, how are we going to get here yep. and said, hey, guys, what you need to put in here is is a ceiling. Th- they would have just like stared at me with the <laughs> dumbest look like, what are you talking You're about? Crazy, You're such an man. idiot. Like there's no way. Yeah. I mean, we're struggling to get there now. And someday mm-hmm. the things that you do, I mean, it's, it's a huge debt of gratitude we owe to them. You mm-hmm. know, the, the biologists who came before us who just, you know, could we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Um, they, they did a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of heavy work and it's, it's made our jobs a whole lot easier. And we're thinking in a completely different direction yeah. um, because of the, the efforts and the sacrifices that they made, you know, to get us here. So, well, you're someone who's really dialed in on a lot of this stuff, Jonathan. And I think, I'm. I'll throw this out there because you, you're someone who I don't want to put you on the spot, but you have perspective and insight that maybe some other people don't see or, or have as their daily work. And I was at a conference in November, and the topic came up about something very similar to what you just mentioned. It was about snow geese and white-tailed deer, and it was. Our North American model and all of the foundational building blocks that support that for the science, the biology, the the way that we operate across pretty much all species in all states was a model built for recovery of species. Because yeah. as you'd mentioned, back in the day, a lot of people just throwing their hands up, well, this is, they're gone. They're, you know, the, the last of their kind. And so... Immense effort, dedication, commitment by so many people, so many organizations, so many agencies have got us to where we are today. And so the question was posed at that conference, do we have to start thinking about the North American model and its foundational blocks that support it Uh, and maybe reconsider how we shift from recovery to management and maintenance of yeah. certain species. Just it, sustaining. Yeah. You know, instead of trying to, to grow, right. like it always has been before, grow, mm-hmm. grow, 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 grow. We need right. more, we need more, we need more. Yeah. We got a whole lot now, guys. Yeah. We, matter of fact, we might have too many. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's an interesting perspective. I think, you know, one of the one of the key things I think a lot of people get or misunderstand about the North American model is that it's not predictive mm-hmm. and it's not prescriptive. You know, it wasn't like someone sat down and said, let's write a model yeah. that, that, that <laughs> does this, you know. Um, yeah. And it doesn't predict what will happen in the future. I mean, the North American model was was simply just, here's here's a description of what evolved right. in and North this, America through how conservation, we through yeah. this is this is what happened. These are the seven tenants yeah. that, that came about and... and, and um, you know they're very powerful. Um, you know the public trust doctrine, the the you know no frivolous use, the right. you know 
regulated hunting versus versus uh, market hunting and yep. and those kind of things and and so we you know when you start thinking about it again yeah i mean it's it's what are we going to do mm-hmm. um you know to just maintain good balance and healthy populations to where you know uh, obviously we don't want snow geese growing anymore and and we we have way too many as it is and 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 really you know rethinking this is you know i think um i'm i'm always blown away at some of these these meetings national and, and international meetings and conferences and stuff i mean i just i work with such absolute rock stars around the country um you know uh, within the pacific flyway so this is it, it's kind of has hit home recently just due to some emails and stuff we've we've really been struggling with with the new uh, meeting schedule that we've had like i said we we used to actually do um seasons at the same time of the same year we were in and now we're yeah. a, a kind of a year out almost yeah um and and so we've struggled with with kind of that new rearrangement and and so i've got 11 states in the pacific flyway mm-hmm. that i work with and um in all in all rights i mean just absolute rock stars i mean these these guys are are guys and gals are 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 just you know they're unbelievable in their state i mean that's yeah. i learn so much from them every single time i'm out there with them and um and and just that makes me better personally and professionally i mean they're they're awesome but at the same time um the analogy i use is i say you know it's kind of like a dog kennel right imagine 11 dogs highly top regarded dogs that are all specialists yeah. in their particular area they all were trained by different trainers you know and and so all that stuff now you got to bring them together mm. as as a kennel as a right. team how difficult sometimes that can be <laughs> um you know suddenly you know you're, you've got a a, a a pack of 11 dogs who's got to like you know manage their way through this and so everyone brings something unique to the table uh one might be a a great water retriever one might be a great pointer one you know right. like okay how do right. we you know how do we function the, the same with so, each of these 11 state yeah biologist yeah. managers who you deal with yeah and that's and it's exactly the thing i mean you know um the pacific flyway is is i think in more ways different than the same um when you look at the states that are involved and and um you know how we how we manage to uh, the suite of species we deal with the uh, the challenges we all deal with um uh you know alaska versus arizona right classic example <laughs> um, big difference california versus montana yeah. um you know i mean there's there's a lot of difference here yeah. um and 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 the the political landscapes and things and so um when i start thinking about the north american model in these terms i mean i i i I do know that there's just a, a plethora of really smart people. And so I don't know. I mean, it's it's great that we're using the model to yeah. kind of how do we okay. rethink things? Yeah. But I think I think some of these things are gonna happen. Um mm-hmm. very smart people are are going to to do something that I think will eventually kind of get adopted by all of us that, that's that's significant enough that all of us will have a, a stake in it. And then later down the road someone's gonna go, oh. That's the eighth tenet of the North American model. Right. Like you know, it'll be a, a descriptive versus a prescriptive thing, and and uh, it's because we're all we're all like, man. I mean, we're in a new era yeah. uh, of wildlife and and stuff, and and you know, it's it, it is it is different. It is different. Yeah. Um, so some of, I'll, I'll throw out some of the topics that came up, and they're they're definitely somewhat regional, and that's why. It, this whole adaptability of how the model is built on a state-based system, yeah. not a national system. It, we call it the North American model, but it's at its core is a state-based model. Sure. Um, so one person was describing the extreme overabundance of white-tailed deer that they deal with in their state and how for a multitude of reasons they're not able to harvest enough and their agency is doing these studies and the the forests are becoming heavily impacted by way too many white-tailed deer. And so cities are hiring sharpshooters because they're a nuisance now in the cities. The legislatures are getting 
uh, pressure from auto insurance companies to bring number downs to lower vehicle deer collisions. Forestry managers are saying, hey, we're, once this level, we're reaching a climax forest and there's no, it, the age class of our forest is all super mature because the deer have eaten every small little browse piece. Mm -hmm. And so the person said, all right, the tenant that says no market use of wildlife, I think we're going to have to readdress that in some areas when it comes to white-tailed deer that people should be able to sell white-tailed deer. And, well, and, I, and I, I took a deep breath like, What? Yeah, but this so I, I can tell you um, that particular question in general that that hit at the wildlife community, biologist management community, I think about three years ago. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, because that was posed. Um, you know, we 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 go back to the North American model. And you talk about you know market hunting versus regulated hunting, right? And really, the argument is unregulated versus regulated. Yeah. Um, and and so. Um, that question was posed at the Wildlife Society, and man, did it cause, I mean, it <laughs> ripped the audience in half. I bet. Um, because you fell in one camp or another. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually fall on the on the side of, me personally, um, with to that, to that re respective, I look at it and I go, what about regulated markets yeah. for wildlife? Because um, I will tell you, um, there's one species in particular that we've already seen this in mm -hmm. that it worked. Right. Um, it was the American alligator. Alligator. Yeah. And that the Florida guy brought. So in this conference, we had the floor one of the former Florida Wildlife Commissioners there, mm -hmm. and everyone is have like you. The room almost split in half in this discussion. Oh yeah. And none of us were from alligator country except this Florida guy, and he said, "Well." I don't know what everyone's so worked up about. We've already crossed that threshold as it comes. And, and he reminded us that the American alligator was on the endangered species list it at was. one time. It was. And now they have regulated market sale of harvested alligators. Yes, they do. So, it, and, and it actually, I mean, a, a lot of people like to claim credit for the recovery of, of American alligator, particularly the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, mm -hmm. because it was it was one of the few species that has actually come off the right. list. Yeah. But the reality of it is the commercial regulated markets for alligator did the most for that because, you know, I mean, you see on TV now swamp people and yeah. things like that. <laughs> there's there's communities of, mm -hmm. of I mean, it, it gave value to the people who who are in the areas where living with it, where alligators are. And before they just used to eliminate them. And now there was a value to them and, and, and to, to their livelihoods and stuff. And so they began to protect them. It wasn't just, you know, the Game and Fish or, you know, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. It was the people mm -hmm. because they were like this is how we're gonna you know this is how we're gonna make a living the the more gators we have the bigger they get the more money we're gonna get yeah and so we don't want poaching and so they would tell on their neighbors they would you know i mean they were <laughs> this is how it works so i mean yeah they're absolutely right i mean we have crossed that threshold um i think there are a lot of challenges oh yeah um it, you know particularly one of them being the usda um mm -hmm. Um, we run into this a lot, particularly with the wild game cookoffs. Yeah. Um, I mean, a oh, lot. lot. Yeah. Um, you do a bunch and, of those. And we run into it in Yuma with, with Crittine's restaurant who, who cooks doves. Yeah. Um, you know, which you've gotten to experience. I know. That's excellent. Um, it, you know, wildlife is not considered food mm -hmm. according to the USDA. Right. Unless it's inspected by a USDA inspector. Now, theoretically, it is possible to get USDA inspectors to inspect processed meat at meat processors mm -hmm. and get it certified. But according to the USDA and as a whole, I mean, wild game is not food. Mm. Wow. Um, you know, and the only way it can actually be sold, it has to be inspected by these inspectors. And, right. and, and uh, you know, I know they're, they're overworked and overtasked and all that stuff. <laughs> right. Anyway, with the cattle, the pork industry, the poultry yep. industry, those kind of things. But there's a lot of infrastructure that would have to get in place because I'm going to tell you what, there are a ton of American restaurants who would love nothing better than to purchase 
Randy Newberg elk loin from Montana <laughs> um, and pay you a very high mm-hmm. dollar to be able to serve it in their restaurant mm-hmm. because they know you're getting quality animals and those kind of things. I mean, you know, it's, uh, um, I mean, you definitely see it in, um, uh, it, as involved as people are in their food these days. I mean, mm-hmm. um, uh, Portland, uh, Oregon has, has, has almost kind of been the, the butt of a lot of jokes. Yeah. Um, uh, there was that show Portlandia, um, which you know, they, they totally make fun of Portland all the time and, and just the stereotypical kind of, you know, they, they really get into stereotypes there and mm-hmm. the people you run into. But um, it, one of them is, is this food couple and, you know, they find out that the chicken they're going to eat, his name is Steve and he grew up, you know, as, as a free range <laughs> chicken out on this farm. So then they leave the restaurant and go to the farm and they're talking to the farmer. They wanted to see what hut he lived mm. in and what nest he was on. And, and I mean, it's, it's really funny, but there's a serious consciousness um, about your food. I mean, mm-hmm. we do have commercial um, mushroom picking. Yeah. in this country. And I mean, restaurants die for wild mushrooms yeah. that are harvested because they're, they're just not easily cultivated on, on their own. I mean, there's some species you can, but there's a lot you can't. Um, and I think it's the same with wild game where, man, I mean, if, if you knew, you know, you could get, you know, braised Arizona coos deer shanks, um, <laughs> you know, at, at some you yeah. know, highfalutin restaurant in Minneapolis, Minnesota, mm-hmm. um, you know, what? By God, people would pay for it. And they would pay a pretty penny for it. Yeah. So um, I, I throw that out there just because I think with a lot of species, we are at that threshold. And I'm not advocating for one way or the other. Sure. I'm saying there are issues ahead of us because of how much great work has done, as you've said, you know, today's biologists feel like they're standing on the shoulders of giants in not just the crane world, but you, yeah, you talk everywhere. about people in the, in, you, you use wild turkeys for an example. You know, who, who would have ever dreamed wild turkeys would have, would be a nuisance in just about every place sure. they're present. Fully uh, recovered a nuisance now. Yeah. Um, and actually in that conference, it one of the presenters was wildlife nuisance or... Uh, uh, I can't remember what other term they had. A- anyhow, it was trying to m- make the distinction between when does wildlife go from being a wildlife we cherish and that we're worried about to this is a nuisance. We have Canada geese crapping on every golf course in America. Mm-hmm. We have ge- Canada geese taking over city parks where kids aren't even playing anymore. He went on and on about all these places where wildlife, to some degree, has become a nuisance. And is the North American model, as as we've kind of built it, and, and for anyone listening, it's not like some scripture that here's the model and every state follows it exactly this way. It's just, like, here are the seven common tenets that all models, all state programs kind of go around. And so the the person's point is, do we have to start in some instances to have a public appreciation and a public tolerance for wildlife, start addressing the nuisance factor? Sure. And how are we going to address the nuisance factor? Sure. And I just sat there. I, I'd say it's one of the few wildlife conferences I've sat at where I didn't give much input. I just sat and absorbed. And and for me, it was a reality check of how my mind and all my volunteer work has been about growing, 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 more, more, more elk, more this, more that. And now realizing that as a society... Um, there are places we've deemed fully recovered species as a pain in the butt. Mm-hmm. And where does that leave us when you, well, because you know the old slippery slope argument. Well, if we start doing that with nuisance deer, well, then we're going to be doing it with rare wild elk, and then we're going to be doing it with rare wild sheep, and you know, mm-hmm. people will will and, start. And I've, yeah, I mean, I've had a chance, like I said, since this came up about three years ago, um, mm-hmm. to to explore that that commercial idea and and what happens, you know, um, 
because one other area that 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 always kind of seems um, people overlook is is the commercial fishing industry. Mm-hmm. Wild caught salmon versus farm salmon exactly. sells differently. Oh yeah, um, and of course there's an opportunity for commercial fishermen to be able to do that, and that's I think that's where the rub is because you know as as as, as hunters, um, you know you could imagine a market hunter, you know, uh, cheapening the the experience. Um, of what hunting the sportsman's code of ethic and and fair chase and those kind of things yeah um you know because i've i and i we've seen it with the conservation seasons. like i said there's a big difference between hunting and hunting seasons and conservation seasons on snow geese mm-hmm. they're they are two very delineated different and that's how they're in the federal register hunting season conservation season wow um but what we've seen in the conservation season and, and this is where there's some rub particularly with snow geese um is it can bring out the worst in people. Yeah. Um, and so very bad behaviors have been, you know, duly noted um, yeah. during these these spring conservation seasons for snow geese. Yeah. And and I think, you know, if if it was just the system didn't change, but but you, Randy Newberg, were allowed to sell meat. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think I'd have any qualms about, you know, I don't think it's gonna change you. And and how you do what you do, you know, if I, man, if I had a good year and I have access, sure, yeah. I'll sell to some some you know mm-hmm. super restaurant somewhere else, you know, right. if you, if you wanted to, but it's the guys who are motivated by money. I can make money doing this, right. you know, in a, in a new way um, by selling the stuff off because I don't care about that animal. Right. I care about it, the money, and that's where I think. You know, there's the rub with hunters and 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 mm-hmm. biologists and everyone. I mean, it's like this that really cheapens it. You it know, does. to to where they're not in it for the same reasons we are. Yep. You know, they'll take any advantage they can, every loophole they can, oh, yeah. just just to harvest it. Where yeah. you know, and and there's always been, um, you know, a lot of people have brought up venison diplomacy, um, and and it's basically sharing the harvest with right. people. Yep. Um. To get them to see at least a part of what it is, you know, like yeah. part yeah. Of, of what hunting is, you know, for you. Like you're not some knuckle dragon mouth breather, you know, <laughs> shooting deer out of your truck with beer cans spilling out everywhere and all yeah. that. I mean, there's there's a process to this and 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 you really do you're immersed in it and and taking your time and 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 really just doing it. I guess, for lack of a better term, the right way. Right, and sharing um, it to try give people and, to understand. And it just, yeah, say, you know what? Come over to the house tonight. You know, you, you're not a hunter. What? How about we try something? Mm-hmm. You know, um, let's let's have some something unusual that you know is is kind of exciting and stuff for their normal world. Right. Um. And 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 talk to them about it. So I, I think one of the um. I was talking about the other day, you know, there's there's a the big controversy over grip and grin photos. Yep. Exactly. There's been a lot of discussion yeah. about it. A lot of it. And um, so for me it's it's I, I love the discussion because I want people to think, mm-hmm. you know, more than right. anything. Yeah, that's the benefit. Um, but but I will tell you with the grip and grin stuff, I've had a chance to hunt with a lot of millennials who are coming to hunting from the food side. Mm-hmm. They are interested in their food and all that other stuff. And they have told me they do not understand why we need pictures standing over a dead animal. It's not what they want to see. Mm-hmm. They'd much rather see pictures of live animals. Right. And so for me, I've often, I, I, I revert back to uh, uh, the movie The Last Samurai with, with Tom Cruise. I am too. Um, it's, it's, a, it's one of these great movies, but, but at the end, um, uh, the emperor of Japan, um, you know, is, is talking to Tom Cruise and, you know, the, 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 last samurai Mm -hmm. um had died and tom cruise had you know had was was with him at the end and and uh the emperor asked him he's like you you know you were with him at the end he's like he's like tell me how he how he died and tom cruise says no let me tell you how he lived yeah and that's where when i think about these grip and grin photos and all this other stuff you know the the stories we share through venison diplomacy or just with others and all other stuff it's it should be more that let me Mm -hmm. tell you how this animal lived yeah those are our hunting <laughs> That's stories. A good way to look you know, at it. that picture is just simply how it died. Yeah, in that one single instant moment with no context. Mm-hmm. 
but telling you how he lived, where he was, like how I got to the chance encounter, like, I mean, all those other aspects of the hunt. Those are the images that I don't think people who just get a, a quick view into our world when they see the grip and grin no, that's, don't have. Right. They, they, and and that's for me, that's yeah. the cooler part is, you know, let me tell you how they lived. Yeah. You know, the beautiful landscape I was in, the, the most amazing, you know, sights and sounds you'll ever see and, you know, wh where it was. And there's still more out there. Yeah. You know, um, and, and I think that kind of, it, it ties into some of this, mm -hmm. you know, we're, oh, we're in sure. a, in a unique position and, and some guys, man, they don't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. They're like, and I don't think you should, <laughs> I, I'm saying like, I'm, you know, you should be proud of what it is you do. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt. I mean, it, it, you know, I, heck we all like looking at photos of, right. of what someone has harvested mm -hmm. and that, but there's hunters are, hunters know the other struggles in that in that image yeah they know oh, the, sure. the, the heartbreak the heartache the missed we've opportunities to, the yeah we had to reconcile the emotions of that animal is going to feed us but yet it died and so we we have a different context a mm -hmm. different lens through which we see it as Absolutely. hunters than someone else without that context and that, well that yeah someone experience. on social media um uh more recently i mean i we've seen um uh, images taken down um, with no, you know, back and forth on it. And some of these are not horrible images. Um, <laughs> no. Hank Shaw's goose image yeah, I was saw one of the more recent one. It was, yeah. I was blown away because that picture literally was, it, it's as if I had walked into your local grocery store. And said, I want to buy and, that goose. Well, no, I had, and it's as if I would have taken a picture of the meat aisle mm -hmm. and posted it on Instagram and having them take it down. Right. Because it was, it didn't meet their guidelines. I'm like, like seriously? Yeah, that was it. Was really no. It just was six plucked geese. Mm -hmm. I know it's crazy. It, it would have been a, taking a picture of a, of drumsticks in a package. Like yeah. it wasn't any different. It's yeah. it, so it's re, we're we're in a, a unique time where, I mean, I started thinking about this, Randy. I said, you know what? Oh, population wise, we're at about three hundred and thirty million or something yeah, like that. That's last I heard. How many hunters are there? Yeah, we're, it depends on which survey number you read. It's anywhere from 11 to 14 million. So let's say there's 11 million. Yeah. Let's go on to that, that yeah, bottom that's side. That's one out of every 30. Okay. One out of every 30 Americans. So only one out of 30 people knows a hunter. I mean, like how many of those other, or 29, know a hunter? Right. There's a lot of people in the world who don't know anyone who hunts. Mm -hmm. And their only exposure is through that social media lens, right? And and what they see, I mean, it, you know, we know sometimes man hunting is messy. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's have no doubt. I mean, we are killing animals. The, the, you know, as um, an agency, you know, it, it's it's for me, it's it's you know, I'm looking at the total, like how how many did all the hunters harvest right. using that term harvest. Mm -hmm. In that sense, is is how you know it's 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 a agricultural term, right? How much was the harvest? But mm -hmm. on an individual level, it's I killed something, right? And the blood is there, and you know it's how do we be respectful in those kind of things? Because it's on my, I mean, it's a blood sport. There's no question. Mm -hmm. No, um, and, and that's that's the challenge that we face. And I often say, I don't know that society was ready for social media <laughs> and that we as hunters are a cross-section of society so we weren't ready for social media but i i think those are are hard questions that everybody is going to ask of themselves and because it's a new paradigm of the last i'll say six to seven years that we've seen a lot of it it's it definitely is having it, it's defining where it's going to take us. And I I don't have that. I don't think anyone really has the answer. No. But like you were saying, the awareness of knowing that the other 29 people that you out of 30 you encounter, maybe some might know a hunter, some might not. Uh there's some degree of, of awareness of what hunting is, but for the large portion, there's, they're like you said, coming to it of, wow, that's a dead animal. Why did you do that? And why are you smiling? Yeah. 
You look like a maniacal psychopath <laughs> standing over a dead mm. animal carcass. That's yeah. literally their view on it. No, I, it, it's um, absolutely true. And as someone who does what I do, the number of, I call them love letters, uh, threats that, you know, this is going to be your fate. You're going to, you know, people are going to show up at your house and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you really get to see that there are some folks who, and there, I'm, I write them off as the fringe on that side of things. Uh, there are some people who are completely disconnected from the fact that their existence on this planet results in the death of animals. Oh, absolutely. They, they are, and, and I never like to say anyone is uh, ignorant, but they are, their life experiences have not allowed them to see death of animals as the result of their presence. And therefore, they're, they think that I'm here, I'm, I'm using natural resources, I'm using energy to light my house, run my car, whatever, and, 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 uh, or the answer is, oh, yeah, I'm a vegan well, they have no concept of how much displacement happens for agriculture and then mm -hmm. agriculture, you know, producing that broccoli or whatever it is they feel is this socially acceptable food item, uh, how many animals die in that process. And I'm not, I, I don't have the false expectation that they're going to somehow have the epiphany that, oh, yeah, I'm going to become a hunter. I guess in the longer term, as our society becomes more urban and less less non-urban, less rural, and people are able to pay others to be removed of that difficult reconciliation that comes with taking your own food, whether it's fishing, whether it's gardening, whether it's growing chickens in the backyard. That's why I love this whole chicken movement. Yeah. I love seeing these people with these chickens in their backyards because they are getting this firsthand experience of how food gets on their table. Absolutely. And I think that's nothing but positive if they never hunt to see for them to have to go and convert that live animal to a dead piece of meat there's a huge amount of value to all of us in in that and i also think that as we look at as, as, at a society we take want to take claim as being the country that brought forth the conservation ethic to the world and I think we did in a lot of respects. Sure. But as people get less and less connected to the natural way in which the natural world works, that something lives at the expense of something else, how long will we have this conscience, this understanding of the natural world where we can really be advocates for it? Sure. Um, maybe I'm... Maybe I spend way too much time driving down the road worrying about no, and I, <laughs> esoteric I, I, stuff. I think you're, but. you're you're absolutely. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that that um, I would point out um, in, in that bigger thing, and because one of the things I, you know, it's like ah, oh, you know, there's these these fringe idiots and all this other stuff, and because they say there's equal amounts of antis compared to those who are right. who are, are advocates. Um. Kind of over my course of time, what I've what I've realized, saying you know, hunting with with some of these millennials and stuff to understand, like, and they're coming from hunting at a totally different angle mm -hmm. than yeah. what I had ever expected. Um, now, speaking to some of your older audience members on the podcast and yourself and me and all this stuff, <laughs> we we understand the term the Bambi effect. When the movie Bambi came out, and you know his mother was killed, and and how that was like really hard for hunters, mm -hmm. you know, at, at that point, people's view of hunting was, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's so awful. You killed Bambi's mom and all that stuff, yeah. and that's kind of really what its drive was. Well, there's a couple of things that that's that have occurred to me as I've as I've talked to millennials to understand that that these people aren't fringe. You have mm -hmm. to kind of dig into to their era and how they grew up. And, and there's right. two things that, that became really apparent to me, or at least kind of realizations I had. Um, in, in more recent times in history, um, 
as as kids growing up. I mean, obviously, you know, there's more television now. There's there's all this other stuff. Um, a lot of the heroes of of a lot of millennials as children's programming has kind of has come up. Um, is a lot of animals. Yeah. Finding Nemo, Happy Feet, all the stuff, yeah. and and not only are they animals. Like we watched animal programs growing up. I mean, we saw mm -hmm. you know uh, Jack London's you know right. Call of the Wild and Marlon you know, Perkins or Mutual of Omaha. Exactly, yeah. we saw animals as they were, and most animals were portrayed that way. But the animals today are portrayed anthropomorphized. Right, they they have human characteristics. They're relatable. Mm -hmm. They speak. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. not just, I mean, you know, I think probably the closest we had maybe was like Jungle Book or something. <laughs> um, and and yeah. so, and I go back to my college days where I had a, a mammalogy professor and she was really, really interested in, in what was happening along these lines. And so one of our assignments was, our job was to go out and this is for a mammalogy class. I mean, it's, it's mm. like one of the funniest things in the world. All of our assignments, and not everyone had to do it at the same time. It was like two or three a night. Two or three of us a night had to do this. Go find a children's book, an, an animal book, and bring it in and read it to the class. And we would evaluate you know, wow. this, this idea of anthropomorphization. <laughs> well, so let me tell you what happened to me, which was really interesting, because I, 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 I took this assignment pretty seriously, and I said, mm. you know what? Man, as a kid, one of the things, the, the, the most classic book that I loved as a kid was Peter and the Wolf. Mm. I, had, I had the old school with the record that had the, the actual yeah. music <laughs> that went with it, you know. Yeah. And I just remember sitting in front of the record player listening to this, you know, grand orchestra, you know, playing and it, it had the different pieces for the different people and animals and stuff as mm -hmm. it went through. And as I would read the book, well, in my original book, that I was, that I, you know, had read it as, as a kid. Um, you know, so essentially what happens is, is the wolf, and spoiler alert if anyone hasn't read Peter and the Wolf, um, <laughs> but the wolf eats the goose. Mm -hmm. Then the hunters show up, they kill the wolf and cut him open and the goo pull the goose out and it's still alive. Yeah. Probably not likely in, a, in the real world situation, right. but anyway. Yeah. So, I, God, I hadn't read that book in years. And this is still, I mean, when I was in college, I mean, this was probably 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I went down to my local bookstore. I was like, hey, I'm looking for Peter and the Wolf. He said, oh yeah, you know, the children's section on stuff. So I bought the book. And before I went into class, I, I you know, flip it open and had all this new illustration and stuff. I don't remember who wrote it. But I get to the end and the wolf eats the goose. The hunters come. Um, and... The wolf spits out the goose, and they take the wolf to the zoo. Oh, that nice. was classic, uh, classic Russian children's literature mm -hmm. that has now been changed. There mm -hmm. was no death, yeah. you know, and, and everybody lived, and it was happily ever after. Wow. Because I mean, Peter and the Wolf comes from the Urals of Russia, right. where they hunted wolves actively and all that stuff. And I know we have a lot of wolf issues today, mm -hmm. and we're all struggling with it here in North America. But to the point where now the hunters, you know, something yeah. somehow they got the wolf to spit out the goose <laughs> who's still alive and to take it to the zoo. Oh, and gosh. so kids don't get to hear the story right. the way I did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been sanitized a little bit. A lot. And so these, you know, a lot of the, the millennials and, and, and kids coming up now are getting a different view or version of the world than the one we mm -hmm. had. Oh, for sure. And that's driving their perspective. And so, you know, like I said, when a lot of their heroes are animals and they're anthropomorphized and and we have this, this you know, cleaner version, mm -hmm. um, this is where some of those thoughts come from that they have. They're not fringe. Yeah. This is mainstream to them. Yeah. We're fringe, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> on those perspectives because, mm -hmm. you know, the world was different when we came up. Yeah. And I always hate to say that, but it, but it truly, I mean, you start picking up these just little nuances of difference mm -hmm. in and what's it, happening. And, and, and so they do look at the world a different way I, um, and how they see things. So. I, I often tell when I've asked, I'm asked to speak, and this is just over a life of, of interacting and meeting and forcing myself. I, I force myself to read, watch, and consume differing 
perspectives and opinions. Sure. I, 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 it's like, all right, what am I doing to force my thinking elsewhere? Uh, not because I in, intend to have it sway me, but I'm trying to gain perspectives and see where other people are coming from and why. And if there's one thing I've learned is that a lot of people may appear different, but at the core, I think most people are the same. And the appearance is what their life experiences have been. Mm -hmm. So how they express themselves and how they act, how they how they might s express, oh, this is my view on wildlife or on animals or whatever. It's a, in large part because of what their life experiences are, mm -hmm. are, not because they're ignorant or they're stupid or you know the, we we tend to say oh those dumbasses or the, you know bunch of idiots or it's not that it's that they did not grow up like I did where I still remember my dad bringing home a deer throwing it on the kitchen table and starting to convert that to what we're going to eat for the next few months. Sure. I mean, I'm four years old. I'm eye to eye with that deer laying there on the kitchen table with its tongue hanging out and blood dripping on the floor. And my mom saying, Delbert, you're making a mess. And my dad saying, don't worry, there will be a lot more to clean up by the time I'm done here. <laughs> um, and so for me, that was a life experience that quickly taught me something's going to die so we can eat. But they're, they're, like you said, they're between generations, over time, over just urbanization, whatever it might be, people have way different uh, life experiences that are going to give them perspectives that are different than ours. So how do we, how, how do, the, the reality is still there that something dies so everything can live. How do we make sure that, <laughs> yeah, we, we can't, I, I, I'm even struggling to articulate how how you would go about it, but how how does a society not lose grip to that? And, and I'm not saying everyone should become a hunter. I know that's not going to happen. But in my mind, the, the first part is you don't do things to reinforce their biases that their life experiences mm -hmm. will lead them to. If you guys are a bunch of knuckleheads, uh, and that can be behavior, it can be imagery, it could be messaging of thing. I mean, I produce messaging related to hunting. I often think, am I doing the right thing? How are people outside of the hunting world receiving my messaging? Um, so there's so many of those things that are changing really, really fast. Back to your point of how this user pays everyone benefit yeah the system. Uh, the system that's at risk because of these demographic changes the people's understanding that wildlife sometimes is a nuisance you know what we should be thankful we have as much of it as we do even if it is a nuisance because as quick as it becomes a nuisance along comes legislatures and others who say i want to have a say in this and the reason they want to have a say in it is way different than what we do so i guess the, the point of all of that wrapped together is that in the next whether it's 10 years or 20 years whatever it is there's a lot of challenges of how the social aspects of well, i think you as a trained wildlife biologist there are going to be people who they're training in the social science and understanding and interpreting are going to have a lot of sway. Well, and, in, and that's in where we go with wildlife and, and like I said, you know, going back to the earlier statements, you know, when the alarm got sounded that there was a problem coming mm -hmm. because of the loss of hunters and this this almost kind of a I guess you'd call it a, a hunter bubble. Yeah. Of of baby boomers who are suddenly going to be aging out and they're not being Replaced. followed up at that same level because that's how agencies are funded. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and for those of us who work for agency, I mean, we're the ones who are tasked with managing wildlife. Yeah. Um, in every state. Every state that's who the authority is given to. Um so we we took it very seriously. Um and and one of the things we did, you know, fairly recently after that um, was we hired uh, a human dimensions coordinator, hmm. um, 
uh, we had a guy for a while, Lauren Chase, um, mm -hmm. PH, Dr. Lauren Chase. He's was phenomenal. Ended up going to work for um, uh, Oregon just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, left us, and now I think he's freelancing now. But but these are our social scientists. Yeah. Um, to understand, um, you know, these these are the guys who crunch numbers in in the most amazing ways and and figure out how to ask questions without bias associated with it to get at the true heart of like he, they would we would sit down and have a meeting mm -hmm. before we ever developed a questionnaire. It's like, what is it you want to know? Okay, how do we ask them not just one question but several questions that really get at the heart of is this the true answer that they're after? And yeah, and um. And there's a number of agencies who've who've kind of followed suit and had these, you know, human dimension stuff where they're they're trying to figure out. I mean, we even even as biologists, I mean, I think one of the things that we we probably don't get a lot of training of um, in college, but but definitely when you get on the job, you start <laughs> realizing that that there are, um, it isn't all just biology, right. There's some social science to this, you know, <laughs> um, because because yeah. biologists. I mean, we're you know we're we're a funny group of people. Um, I was uh, uh, at, at a while back when when I was doing the upland stuff. I was talking to a group of quail hunters and um, trying to explain to them, you know, what my role was uh, with our commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, as the scientists, you know, so I'm the, I'm a staff support for our commission. They're the ones that make the decision. I simply make recommendations. Yeah. They're allowed to, to do it, you know, do right. whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, so anytime they would make changes to the recommendations, I mean, their job is to look at me because they need an honest, no BS assessment. Right. If I make this decision this way, will I negatively impact the resource? Yeah. That's usually the the first and the most major question. If we, if I, if I, for political reasons, which is their job, mm -hmm. they're to be in the political sphere and keep us out of it. Right. If I change your scientific recommendation, you know, will this negatively impact the population? And and so, I always tell them that's that's my first objective. So for quail hunting, um, I'm talking to these quail hunters, and I said, look, I said I understand there's a social aspect biologically. I don't care when you start hunting quail. We can start hunting quail July 1st. If the, the opening date really doesn't have a biological reason, yeah. okay? The end date does because that's when we start impacting populations, when they're starting to pair up and, you know, breeding for the next cycle. But I yeah. said, we can start shooting birds on July 1st. And, you know, the guys in the room are just like, I mean, it's appalling <laughs> to hear that because they're like, we don't want to shoot baby quail. And I'm like, yeah. I know that. Right. That's the social impact. I said the, the opening day of season is a social issue, right. you know, because the same the you're going to shoot the same birds on October first as you're going to on in July first. Mm -hmm. It's just they happen to be bigger in October. Yeah, but <laughs> biologically, you know, take all the strip all everything away. It's not going to impact the population if you start shooting them July first. Mm -hmm. They're the same birds, right? You know, and they just like it, it was just shocking to them. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I think we've. Biologists have have really, you know, we've had to deal with some of these social things and mm -hmm. how to how to kind of work with it and stuff. But it, it's getting the the water's getting deeper. Yeah, and and some of us are, you know, myself included. I mean, in some areas, man, we're out of our league, and we need the help of of serious social scientists mm -hmm. to, to understand. really understand, like, what? How do we, you know? What's what's the real answer here? What is it they're trying to say? What? How do we? You know? How do we educate people? Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the right way. Um, uh, you know, one of the kind of one of the more re interesting recent conversations I've had with folks is, um, particularly about you know the 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 hunter angler types versus um, like the watchable wildlife community, right. the the yep. people who um, you know birders and things like that. Yep. Um, one of the things that's interesting is, is uh, and I've seen through the surveys, um, we did it through the flyway with one of our own, is, is that, you know, hunters and bird watchers both equally consider themselves conservationists. Right. Um, the, one of the interesting things is, is they don't see each other right. as conservationists. Yep. And, and part of this is a perspective thing, like you were talking about, your experience and all that other stuff. Um, I will tell you that a lot of watchable wildlife folks are conservationists and they are spending money. Right. But they're spending money, they're sending their money to like 
World Wildlife Federation or right. you know these international relief efforts and all that other stuff. And so one of the things, you know, so they're spending money the same way hunters are. Mm-hmm. You know, don't discount that. What the challenge has been is to educate these these same watch wildlife folks who are watching here at home, mm-hmm. which is where they do most of their wildlife watching. That it's great you're spending money, but what are you doing here at home? Right. You know, maybe you should be spending your money here in the state. You know, and how do you do that? Purchasing home license, donating to our, you know, to our, our donation accounts for agencies and stuff mm-hmm. to the to the wildlife areas, those kind of things, because they are spending money. But but man, it's it, you know, our challenge has been to to ask them and really challenge them to say, hunters are conservationists too, and and one of the things why you know they're so valued, even though you know you may not see each other in that same light, is because they're spending money at home, right? You know, it's and, a good and, way to look and at so. It. What we're challenging you guys to do is if if you enjoy these resources and the places you go to and all that other stuff, spend your think about spending your money at home. Mm-hmm. You know, in, instead of trying to save you know wildlife on the other side of the planet, right? Because that's going to help us the most. Um, you know, at least for for the North American stuff. I mean, everybody loves pandas, right? Oh, yeah. No one can want to live in a world without pandas, <laughs> right? You know, and so they're it's very easy to gather money for pandas. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. you know, it may not be as cool to gather money for, you know, I don't know, prairie dogs. Right. Or, you know. Coots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> coots or Kawada Mondays or, you know, yeah. who knows what's going on. So yeah. it's, um, it's, it's very interesting in the social sciences to see these two worlds um, together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I've gotten kind of more in depth with yeah. that with a lot of the, the more recent human dimension surveys we've been doing. And, and um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's fascinating because I think it, it, they're definitely, they're there, they're on our side. We just need to come to some common ground. Um, you know, what we share the most. Um, a lot of them are, you know, shocked that we hunt sandhill cranes or that we, right. we hunt waterfowl. But man, you know, duck stamps have paid for a lot of ground in North America called <laughs> National Wildlife Refuges, right. and most people don't know that. No, they, um, there's very the duck few hunters, people the know duck that. hunters, the guys who bought the stamps, and the collectors. They've been paying for a lot of ground for a long time, funding this refuge system. So, yeah, you know, it's it's, but it's it's hard when they hear they hear guns and they don't see the stamps. You right. know, um, so uh, I I didn't when I started using cranes as a way to go to take this tangent about wildlife and the future and the North American model and all that. I didn't mean to distract us from the rest of our discussion. Uh, a couple things that before we're, we're done, I, I have a question. How, when do coots migrate? <laughs> Do, do you know what, what? Do they fly at night or something? I've never seen coots <laughs> flying in the day. I do. You've never shot a flying coot, right? I have never shot a flying that's coot. That's the only way to shoot them. I mean, like, that's the best time to shoot them. When uh, do they fly? <laughs> they migrate a lot with the other ducks. They do. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the fact that coots now, like, it, so mallards have really, you know, taken off and become resident in a lot of places. Yep. Coots beat them to the punch, man, a long, long time ago. It's just mm. like the coots never leave anywhere right. they're always there but the in, um, up in our country they gotta leave or they're gonna get froze out sure sure but i never see them flying it's <laughs> you drive by and it's just black with coots and you come back two days later and they're all gone yep it's like what, they, they must just fly at night that, that, <laughs> that's been my theory they just theory. fly at night and I, I never see them well but. so so you know the old adage of you are what you eat yeah which is why people really like pintail ducks because they're seed eaters or mallards because right. you know any of the seed eaters well interestingly enough a widgeon and a coot have pretty much identical diets no way yeah and so they taste very different <laughs> Yeah, if you've never had a, a a coot versus a widgeon. Yeah, I shot a um, coot. And my dad made me eat it one time. Yeah, they're they're uh, they not, have just about identical diets, but they do not taste the same. It's no, uh, I'll eat every <laughs> widgeon you want to give me. Huh. So the, uh. the old adage of "you are what you eat" doesn't apply always the time. So darn, I wish we would have got into all these recipes. But we, we to 
it's we've been giving you full credit, Jonathan, for the the crane bacon recipe that we hijacked last yep. year from you. Marcus did a full video on that. Well, we did a video on you doing it. Yeah, and then Marcus and then Marcus did ducks, another yeah. video, and I shot my son and I shot six mallards uh, over the long weekend of uh, New Year's. And I made every one of those into bacon. <laughs> Great bacon. Yeah. yeah. The, when I took them off the Traeger, I ate three breasts myself that night. I was swelled up like a big fat wood tick there. Oh, I'm like, oh, oh, man, I can't believe I ate all that. And then I took them to work. And there are five guys there, and it was just like a, a bunch of vultures. They didn't last long? At, no. <laughs> so that, to anyone listening, you need to go to our YouTube channel and check out the duck bacon or crane bacon videos. It it will change. I, I, I think a lot of people don't, they tell their buddy, oh, you take these geese or you take these ducks because they either don't know how to prepare them or they think it's a five-hour process to prepare them. And this crane bacon one that you have is so simple. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really simple. It's one part quick here. Tender quick, Morton's tender quick. And, and then one, one, part brown one part brown sugar. Put them in a bag. I I think. Can you leave them in the bag too long? Because I left mine in the in, in you the. You can, curing. and they'll get they'll get extra saltier. It just depends that's, on how much extra you pack. That's on. what happened. Is um, I, I, I usually say on on cranes and probably Canada geese, I'd probably only do it for about ten hours. Yeah. See, I did it. I I went to work one morning, and I didn't pull them out until the next morning. So it was twenty hours. I did it over They got a lot hour. saltier. Yeah. Yeah. But they're still really good. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, who doesn't like, you know, salty wild game meat, but. Yeah. Um, so. But yeah, it can, it can, it can get overwhelming on some of them. Um, and, and of course you saw with uh, the javelina ham I did. So that one is really under. That's when you, that's when you kind of under cure, under salt them. Because I didn't want it to be like too crazy. Um, you can definitely like if we'd have kept that javelina, if we'd have kept those hawks in there for like five days, yeah, um, it would have been more like you know that breakfast ham you get that's super salty, right? Yeah, um, this was just kind of let's keep it light and and get some of it to just just that light hint flavor mm -hmm. of ham and and have that that nice glaze on the outside. But right. um, yeah, I think um, like some areas of of wild game. That people can really play with, um, like barbecuing, mm -hmm. barbecuing, grilling, smoking, wild meats. Let's let's kind of like an uncharted frontier. There's not a lot of books out on that and how okay. to do it and how to do it well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously Hank has a, some great hey, books. A Hank lot, of, there's, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of um, there's a lot of incredible wild game cookbooks that are out there. But there's yeah. some areas. Um, uh, charcuterie is is another one. You know the the process of making sausage and mm -hmm. curing meats and all that stuff. That's that's a little you know it's it's you have to do some adjustments if you have the the uh, um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. Rollman, Michael Rollman, and um, uh, anyway, they have a, a sausage making book, um, which is kind of like a it's like a bible. You know, mm -hmm. it's great because they everything's standard. But in order to do wild game, you got to kind of you got to massage the recipes a little bit, back off on this, add a little bit more of this, do do some stuff to to really um, you know make it work. And so there's there's a lot of uncharted territory in, in wild game cooking that's that's just phenomenal. Hmm. That I'm always stunned. You know, someone will come up with something. It's like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's it's it, you're you're really you're really kind of just it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge to sit and think about. Okay, what how do I do something? How do I get this flavor? I mean, usually I spend just day, my wife can tell you, I mean, like it, when I'm, when I'm after something, man, I'm like a bloodhound. I just don't give up. I'm like, okay. I think uh, the first time I went to the world championship squirrel cook off, I made, I think I made masa cakes, fried masa cakes for a week straight. I had bought every different brand of masa. I had tried different, like, you know, how do I, 
you know, how do I make this thing right? She was so sick and tired because I was like, <laughs> here, here, try this one and try this one and tell me which one's better. What do you think is better, you know? And, and she's like, I can't eat any more fried masa, John. I'm going to absolutely just just die if you give me one more. So I, I got to run it to ground to, to, to mm. dial it in. But So um, what, what made that chili that you made on Monday night so spectacular? Was there any, I so, mean, it was, so so I'm going to tell you something. That, I mean, like yeah. like that one that chili is it's almost like the dirty little secret chili. Okay, um, it's always my fallback. I, I collect chili recipes. I I love mm-hmm. them. I, mean, I love chili from, too. That's why I'm everything asking. from Texas Red to to mm-hmm. whatever. The vast majority of that chili comes out of a can. Really? Yeah, and 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 it's consistent. So. Um, uh, I, uh, I was in the army with a guy named, uh, named Sergeant Michael Moore. Mm-hmm. Um, not the Michael Moore. Not the Michael Canada, Moore. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to say, let's so, clear that up. So, um, uh. I, he was the first, he introduced me to this chili, you know, served it up his house one night. Cause we were, there's even in the military, I mean, there's not very many hunters and stuff, but mm-hmm. you know, when it comes around, it's, it's kind of, we have our own little club. And, um, uh, so I think he had, he had some deer or something and, and made this chili. And I was like, Wow, this is spectacular! Yeah, so I always call it it's it's, it's Sergeant Mike's wild game chili. Okay. I, I still always give credit to, to Sergeant Mike. He was he was a good guy, and and um, but as long as you can brown meat, mm-hmm. um, you know it's it really is a simple, but but it's you know it's you you have a pound of ground um, meat. You add one tablespoon of cumin. Um, and then at least one tablespoon of chili powder. Mm-hmm. Um, you can add more if you want more heat, if you like more heat. Yeah. Back it off if you don't. And also, you know, um, uh, I always cook in my onions with the, the, the meat there. Okay. And then from there, it can go into a crock pot, it can go into a pan. And then it's two cans of Rotel, um, diced tomatoes with green chilies, mm-hmm. two cans of Bush's baked chili beans. Mm-hmm. Um, you can add uh, another four ounce can of green chilies if you like a little bit. It's always fun because you can play with great right. stuff on this. Um, but um, I think one of one of the secret tricks to that recipe that um, Mike showed me was um, canned refried beans to to thicken the sauce. Hmm. You just melt those refried beans in there um, into it as you're as you're slowly stirring it because it just helps to thicken it and give it just a little bit more. Gotcha. Um, and it's just it's it's so consistent every time it comes out. It's just really good. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 been a fallback of mine for a long time. I'm like I always just love it because it's yeah. It, when you show people how to make, like they'll taste it and they're like, literally, this is better than my wife's chili. Please don't tell her. <laughs> That's like, what I said. It's so awesome. But then you go, you know, it like comes out of a can. They're like, I cannot believe that. Right. Um, my wife makes a, a, a chili that everybody just dies for. Mm-hmm. And it is a lot of work that yeah. she puts into this. And, you know, so uh, people love it. And then, you know, I'll throw this on and it's just like it all came out of a can and it's like, <laughs> oh, it's so good. And, all stuff. and my uh, wife, I mean, she uh, worked hard on her chili, but um, well, yeah, a lot I, of people like that one. And I, I'm like, I don't know if you'd be willing to do this, but if you had that recipe and wanted to send it to me, I'd love to do a YouTube video on it. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah Because it, it, if it's as simple as you say, and it was so good. I thought we were going to get in a fist fight out there with everybody who, who is here, seeing who got to eat the last of it. Oh, yeah. It was, well, and there was not a drop left in the pan. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, and that we were a full house that first night. Right. There was like, not a single drop left. of chili left. And maybe because I'm such a junkie for chili, I'll... I'll go to the biggest dive of a restaurant you've ever seen, and if chili's on the menu, that's what I'm ordering. Yeah, I just I love to try chilies, and sometimes it's atrocious, mm-hmm. and sometimes you say, C- "Can you tell me what's in this? Can you tell me how this is made? Sure. Because this is one to to make note of." Well, and 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 that's the greatest part about chili is that man. It, it's fighting words every time you talk about chili. It doesn't matter where you go in the country because have you had Cincinnati chili? No. Not so that they I know put of. noodles in it. They actually put no, it over no, spaghetti. I've not had Cincinnati um, chili. You know, in Texas, like you couldn't put beans in chili. That's not right. right. That's, oh, that's un American. Sure. You know, you'll get in a fist fight over that stuff. Mm-hmm. You got beans in the chili. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's all these really unique things. Um, I wrote an article about it for our magazine 
I think last year um, about Chile, just you know, kind of some some interesting stuff. And um, in the the Mexican dictionary um, back in I think I think it was like the 1930s, um, it had a definition for chili con carne, mm-hmm. um, and it was the greatest definition of all time. It said um, an American dish. Uh, thought of as Mexican, oh, a, a detestable American dish. <laughs> thought of as 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 Mexican, served everywhere from from uh, Texas to New York City, and uh, um, it was so hilarious. I was like, oh, that is the perfect quote um, because it was just, uh, you know, I think it it just developed out of the whole. I think likely it came out of you know the the Southwest, so likely right. Texas. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just, you know, because the, 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 the basic hallmarks of chili is chili peppers mm-hmm. and meat right? At a, at a bare minimum. Yep. And, and it just kind of evolved from there of how to do it. I think these old chuck wagon cooks were, how do I, you know, get the most out of this? And right. that's probably where beans came in because beans are always on the old chuck wagon. And, yeah. and you start getting these variety, varieties and variations across the, the country and, Mm. Um, like California chili. California chili is one of the most, like weirdest things in the world to me. Every time I have it, it um, there's a, a famous burger place. I think it's called Tommy's, um, and they have a particular type of chili that's really fine. Yeah, it's 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 gritty and fine. Like the whole chili, like there's no textures to it. Like really, of, of being whole beans and meats. And yeah. stuff. it's just it's this whole thing. And I'm always like. This is the weirdest chili. I, th- I mean, it's, to me, I'm like, it's the weirdest chili I've ever ate. But of course, I've had Cincinnati chili in Cincinnati, where it's got, you know, it's a just basically a plate of pasta covered in this like weird, like, <laughs> it, it's like spaghetti that went wrong, um, uh, you know. And man, it's. But I love collecting chili recipes. I mean, that's one of my favorite things is just to, yeah. you know, how is this different? Oh yeah, I always take notes just like you. I'm like, Maybe that's your going to be your wild game trick. Wild get the wild game chili book of yeah. of like all these different ones. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, a <laughs> possibility. I mean, I you know I don't care what temperature it is, man. Weather be damned. You know, if, when it's time to eat some chili, you know you definitely love it when it's cold. Yeah, but um, I, even in the summer, I'm like, you know, I'm really craving some chili right now. Yeah, and oh, so I, you know, cook up a big batch and. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my wife, I have her make it. I don't have her make it. She offers to make it. And I say, well, you're making it. Make a huge batch. And I put it in uh, plastic bags and I freeze it. Yeah. And it's so easy to reheat. And Yeah, leftovers are always good. That's how you can always tell the best chili. The it's best chilies the are, either, day. are either they're all gone the moment they're made. Right. Or they get even better. The next day. As Yeah, as leftover, heated, reheated leftovers. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Well, Jonathan, I could hold you here and talk chili recipes until <laughs> the, the the audience would fall asleep. Probably. <laughs> but, so we've been at it almost two hours, and uh, I can't thank you enough. You, 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 you're a great mix of cooking history, of wildlife history. You're, you're a historian. I know you deny that, but... You always have more little bits and pieces of history and context that the audience enjoys and that that I enjoy. And I, I thank you for hanging out with uh, with us here for the last week and making sure that nobody went hungry. Well, yeah, uh, you, you know, you know, you're never gonna go hungry if I'm around. <laughs> it's 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 pretty standard. Uh, it's like, and, and if and if we're eating really poorly. Mm-hmm. And I have to suffer through it, like that. That won't happen either. Like I'll just, <laughs> hey, can I take over in the kitchen for a minute? Let me let me see what I could do to, to help yeah. out. We gotta well. we gotta dress this up a little bit more. But um, so uh, one of the things um, I was on a, a, another podcast recently, and uh, he always laughs and jokes at me. He's like, he's like, you need to get professional podcaster on your business cards. Yeah, a professional podcast guest. You know, <laughs> it's like you've been on so many podcasts, and I'm like going, I, 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 I don't know why they keep come pull me on, but you know, I, mean, like, I know well, why because you're an interesting person, but also probably the the gateway is they eat some of your wild game meals and they say. I gotta have that guy in my podcast. <laughs> That's probably what's happening. Bro. Yeah, we got we gotta start talking about some food. 
all yeah, everything yeah. else. But yeah, I said, well, I said, well, the next time I order business cards, you know, maybe we'll get we'll get professional podcast guests on there. And there you go. Well, I thank you so much, Jonathan. We could go on and on. Uh, you, I know I said this last year, but I really got to figure out a way to come down and go crane hunting. It just. To, to think of it in the context of 20,000 pterodactyls flying over your head. <laughs> that, that makes There's me... no words. I, I, even until you see it in person yourself, you're just like, wow. This, this, is, this is those... These are these aha moments of, of like, you know, the giant numbers of migrating animals in the Serengeti or mm -hmm. you just you, like, yeah. you know, you just... In those numbers, right. you're just... It's awe-inspiring. Yeah. It's, it, it goes beyond anything you could ever, unless you witness it yourself, you yeah. know, it's, it's just one of those great moments as a hunter and, and an outdoorsman where I just get to go, wow. Wow. You know. So when's the deadline to apply if I... Um, so we're changing things up this year. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, Crane has, Crane has been one of the last hand draws in Arizona. Okay. Like it was, it was paper only. We literally are drawing them out of a bucket by hand, <laughs> just the way the old school used to do it. Um, because it's always been, it's its schedule has been weird. Mm -hmm. So um, now that the things have changed, um, we're going to try it in um, the fall, um, along with all the other fall hunts. So, so you'll actually October. see it in Arizona's big book. Okay. Uh, the booklet usually comes out around in May, um, mm -hmm. end of May, first part of June. Uh, Sandhill Crane regs will be in there, and and it'll be the same application uh, deadline as uh, as all the other fall hunts and all that stuff. So okay, you can apply online and cool, making it easier and and hmm. we'll we'll see what happens. I you know a lot of guys are dreading that that this is going online because you know right. it makes it easier. The, popularity. the hardcore guys are you know they're like <laughs> when's the regs coming out? We know we we know we got to send in papers. So um, it'll be a change this year to see what happens. So yeah. Well, thanks so much. I hope we get a chance to share a couple of days out hunting cranes. Oh, that'd absolutely. Be, yeah, anytime. Great you're more than welcome. Thanks for having me on again. It's always a pleasure and an honor. So yeah, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate all you do for wildlife and uh, all you do for my stomach. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>